First of all, on behalf of the hardworking team at Waymo, especially the women creating the Waymo driver and our business, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for our inaugural Self-Driven Women event. Before we start, a couple of logistics. Please use the chat tab to share your thoughts and comments and use the ask tab to submit your questions. We've already received lots of questions from you and we'll try to get through as many as we possibly can. Today, August 26th, we celebrate Women's Equality Day, which marks the 100th anniversary of the adoption of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote in the United States. If we know the history of voting rights in the United States, we know this was not the end of the fight for equality for all women. Over the past century, there has been enormous progress on the road towards gender equality, but the work is far from complete. Equality is something that is near and dear to me personally and Waymo as well. So I'd like to take a few minutes and introduce myself as well as Waymo and then introduce our panel. So I'm Takedra Malakana. I'm the COO of Waymo. I've spent over two decades in tech helping to advance the business interests of large tech companies around the world tackling novel and complex issues. I began my career as a lawyer focused on transactions within the regulated technology and telecom industries. I joined Waymo three and a half years ago as head of global public policy. My role evolved after that to lead marketing, public affairs, and communications. In 2019, I was named Chief Operating Officer, where I continue to lead our external engagement functions. And I also oversee operations, business strategy, business development. Overall, my job is to ensure that Waymo's transformational technology is commercialized across various platforms. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Waymo, but in case you're not, I'll tell you a little bit about Waymo. We're building the world's most experienced driver, the Waymo driver. Waymo is a self-driving technology company with a mission to make it safe and easy for people and things to get where they're going. And we are the first company to put a fully self-driving car on the road without a person behind the wheel. And that was back in 2015. In 2009, we were tasked with working on something, bringing self-driving technology to the public that most considered impossible. Before COVID seriously hit the US back in the spring, we were proud to serve riders across Metro Phoenix every day. Thousands of riders have used our app to hail a Waymo One ride to get around in the Phoenix Metro area. And while we're extremely proud of the progress we've made over the last 10 years, we are here today because there's still more work to be done to make this technology available to more people. Today, I have the honor of moderating a discussion about the opportunities and challenges of being women working in mobility. We've all seen firsthand the power and success that engaging, embracing, and empowering women in tech can bring. I'm hopeful that this discussion will bring awareness to the low representation of women in our space by highlighting their contributions and illuminating an inclusive path forward for all. Before we dive into this discussion, I'd like to give our panelists a few minutes to introduce themselves. And I'll start with Michelle, Michelle Avery. Well, thank you. What an honor to be here with everyone today and especially with all of these women on the panel with me. I'm Michelle Avery. I'm the head of automotive and autonomous mobility at the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum has been around for 50 years. We work in the public private partnership space, working to improve the state of the world. And what that means for me and my colleagues in mobility is we want to work to make sure mobility is safe, is clean, 
and is inclusive. I come to this work with over 20 years of automotive experience, mostly in the technology space, working on safety and connected vehicles. But I did come to this from a background in banking as a traditional economist before I made the leap from international banking into automotive. And I've never looked back. It's been a really great decision. So I, I look forward to sharing some of the things I've learned with everyone along the way. Thank you, Michelle. Raquel? Thanks. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be here today. I think it's definitely a great moment of celebration to see, you know, sales driven women. And as there is only, you know, a few of us here, but there is so many more out there and so many more that should be there. Um, and we hope that, you know, a lot of you will join us. Um, so let's see, I'm a chief scientist at Uber ETG, as well as a head of R&D and a professor at the University of Toronto. So let me try to very quickly bring you to my journey towards getting where I am today. Um, I was born in Pamplona, which is a small town in Spain, uh, many, many years ago. Um, and although I do uh, AI, artificial intelligence, this town is very well known for the running of the bulls, which is you know, very unrelated, I guess. Um, <laughs> and many, many years ago, more than 20 years ago, I decided to go for an internship uh, to France and then that was the last day that I lived in Spain. Um, since then, I did my PhD in Switzerland, moved to the US, which, uh, which was you know, where everybody was going at the time. And six years ago, I moved to Canada. Um, so I was a professor there, and I was very excited to build uh, you know, self-driving uh, technology in terms of research. But one thing was missing, which is you know, I knew that people were using our technology to, you know, in companies, but I wanted to be part of really bringing this a reality such that everybody out there can actually benefit from this technology, no matter what your income is, no matter where you live. And this is why I decided to start this journey with Uber. Um, and this is where we are today. That's great. great. Tilly. Thank you, Takedra. Thank you, Waymo, so much for having me and sponsoring this wonderful day of celebration for Women's Equality Day. My name is Tilly Chang. I serve as the executive director here at the San Francisco County Transportation Authority. So greetings to everyone in the Waymo community around the world. Um, I have been serving here at the TA for about 17 years, um, seven of those years as the executive director and the prior 10 as the deputy for planning. Uh, I'm a planner, I'm an urban planner. Uh, I studied planning in grad school here in the Bay Area at Cal, uh, that's UC Berkeley, um, and then went on to study further in Boston and began my career um, as a new young uh, post-grad student in Washington, D.C. at the World Bank. Uh, from there, I uh, was fortunate to head uh, back to California. Um, I spent some time at MTC, which is our Bay Area regional agency, but also at a wireless startup. Um, and that was fascinating and very exciting um, as a young person uh, coming into uh, the industry at that time in the early 2000s. Uh, but soon I found that my passion really was in helping to uh, improve cities. I went back to the city level through the Transportation Authority, um, and I've been there you know, since, since, since 2003. Our agency is the Planning, uh, Coordinating, Funding, um, and Congestion Management Agency for San Francisco. And uh, in that role, we uh, work with partners um, across all the modes, certainly all the transit operators, the bicycle and pedestrian uh, networks, and even the freeways. So um, I look forward to, again, sharing more about our work and my, uh, my path. Thank you. That's great. Really exciting and I appreciate all of you for doing those introductions. Um, so as today's conversation will be about uh, careers in part in transportation as well as self-driving, um, we thought it would be good to open with the uh, a poll for the audience. So if everyone could go to the tab that says poll and tell us where you are in your career, um, it would be great for us to know who has joined us and um, whether you're just starting a career in mobility, you're in another industry, or you're a seasoned professional and uh, just looking to network and get to know more people. And in the meanwhile, I will start with questions for the panelists. Um, and so I'll start with Tilly. 
which is, um, you said you've been in your current role for 17 years. You know, how did you start your career in mobility? Well, thank you again. I think it must have started even as a kid growing up here in the Bay Area. You know, just taking your bus to the mall or riding your bike to the bowling alley. Um, that really represented freedom. And I didn't know it then, but my love affair with cities probably began then. Um, it wasn't until I went to grad school and did an internship with the uh, then called Santa Clara County Transportation Agency, um, the predecessor to now Valley Transportation Authority, uh, that, um, that I really understood that this you could have a career in this amazing field. So uh, I was, I think, a combination of those internships and my early um, sort of studies at Berkeley, um, where I studied environmental um, policy and urban planning and civil engineering and sort of saw that the intersection of these really is transportation, including, um, you know, the social aspect, which I thought was really, really important as I saw the, um, uh, the need to provide for those who are, are, are very transit dependent. That's great. Thank you for that. And Michelle, you mentioned that you made this transition from banking. Um, and so I'd love to hear more about that transition and also whether in all of your years in automotive, whether mobility is the way you thought about it then. Yeah, thank you. I, I started my mobility career in, uh, in the early 1999 with uh, Toyota Motor Sales when they were based in Los Angeles. They're now based in Plano. And a friend of mine actually recruited me in there out of the banking industry. I used to be an international banker doing emerging markets. And it turns out that the skill set of an economist is very similar to the skill set needed to be a strategist for automotive and really looking at what are those big impacts that are going to be hitting the industry. And back then it was online retailing. How is there people going to want to buy cars and buy parts online? That was the big question. But over in the corner was this little thing about what if we put cell phones in cars? And nobody knew what that was. And I went, hey, that's really interesting. And got very, very involved in the telematics and the connectivity piece of it. And that the anchoring value of connected vehicles has always been, in my mind's eye, safety and how we can improve product safety because automobiles, by their very nature, they can and they do kill people because we operate them. Obviously, as we let the robots begin to operate them, hopefully those uh, numbers go down dramatically. That's, I believe, very strongly in that promise. Um, but that's how I got into automotive. And I absolutely did not think of it as mobility. That took quite an, uh, a shift to look at where light passenger vehicles fit within the broader picture. And what is that responsibility that you have, not only as a vehicle owner and operator, but as someone who sells and services vehicles because they don't operate in isolation. And so at the World Economic Forum, that's where I've really made a full transition to understand automotive space within the broader mobility ecosystem and the topics only get more interesting and actually even more impactful that's great that's great thank you so much for that um raquel you talked a little bit about your sort of using your background in ai and ml to uh put it to practical use in the company environment i'd love to hear how that transition has gone for you from, I mean, you're still teaching, but um, moving into the Uber space. Yeah, so so I guess, uh, so for me, uh, so I've been doing AI for 20 years, right? And mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I look at self-driving as an application of machine learning and computer vision. And I thought, you know, this, this looks interesting. You know, after that day, it became an obsession. And it's an obsession because, you know, it's such an interesting technical challenge, right? Which has, you know, something that really attracts me. But at the same time, it's something that it really has the potential to change the way that we live, right? And, and you know, this is something also like, uh, you know, very interesting from the perspective of uh, not just, you know, being developing technology, but 
you know, do it for the greater good. And I think self-driving has really the potential to bring mobility to so many people that don't have. Yes. Yes. That's definitely something that it's part of why I asked Michelle the question about whether um, we talk about mobility today in a very different way than, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And I think access to opportunity and mobility are so clo closely aligned. And so the idea that whether it's from a technology perspective or a municipal perspective or an organizational, global organizational perspective, the chance to have impact is so much greater. And so given that, one of the things I'd love to hear from each of you are you have these impactful careers. What are some of the challenges that you face that you've had to overcome um, in either your current successful role or in, in previous roles? And uh, I'll start with Raquel. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, if I look at uh, my career, right, so I come from a humble family in a place in Spain that nobody knows about for technology. Right. And it's been a long journey, right? Uh, or a difficult journey as well from there to where I am today. Right. And so there has been so many instantiations of people that wanted to tell me that I was not sufficiently worth or I could not do as well as other people. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned through this journey is really to never give up and believe on myself. Right. And it's when, you know, you, you know, when people try to, uh, you know, try to tell you into who you are, uh, in a, you know, in a, in a bad way so that they can feel better, right. It's their insecurities. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, after a while I realized that it was more of that and actually issues with myself. Right. And I think that, you know, I think this journey hasn't been easy, right. But I think it's been, it has really strengthened me and. Uh, and I think it's important to also tell the younger generation that you're not alone when you actually suffer from, you know, discrimination or, uh, you know, things, biases, etc. And I think that, uh, you know, it's important to know that all of us that have arrived in very successful positions, right, we actually struggle in this journey. And, you know, this is just, you know, it's important that you don't give up, right? And then you continue pursuing your dream because, you know, it's really achievable. And I think that's, you know, the most, most important thing that you need to think about. I love that sort of self-driven women acknowledge the challenges. Um, what, what a wonderful statement. Uh, Tilly, I'll come to you next with that question around challenges. Thank you, Takedra. I, I would have to agree with Raquel. A lot of it is really just, again, um, recognizing that uh, with, your, with your passion and your, your, you know, your, your building your knowledge and your networks, you just have to believe in yourself. Um, I was fortunate that I did have a lot of support. I had family support. I had uh, mentors at, at school and at my early career stages. Um, maybe the, the, the barrier that I think, um, as I moved into the sort of, um, senior ranks and potentially even management and executive ranks, you know, it was my, my age perhaps, because it happened a little bit sooner than we all thought this would happen where my predecessor, our former executive director, uh, retired a little you know, sooner than expected again, unexpectedly. Um, so the opportunity came at a time when I had just had kids. Um, I was still building my knowledge and my skills. Um, I had, a, you know, a good sized network, but I didn't feel like I was yet at that level, you know, of leading an agency. Um, and so it was others who really came um, and, and, and encouraged me, uh, nudged me, pushed me, um, inspired me, um, really uh, provided that support. And um, I had gone through, you know, leadership and other training programs. We can talk about that later. But until you're in that position and in that moment, and you're faced with this opportunity, and it was like, this is not my in my plan. This is not the right time. That this wasn't supposed to happen now. Um, and that's not an opportunity. That's not a barrier. That's an opportunity. But again, your own psychology can also be a barrier. Um, certainly, once I became director, uh, you know, I had to, you know, as an Asian woman, I'm short. You know, I, you know, I look perhaps younger than I actually am. I think I had to, and by that time had had some experience, you know, holding my own and in, in a meeting and a conversation and negotiating things. And then that came as well with experience. But 
but those were some of the early uh, sort of sort of challenges that I had to learn and um, try and overcome. That's great, Michelle. I think it's very interesting for me. It wasn't just getting a seat at the table, being invited into the room. It's actually being heard and understanding that people have different ways of communicating and making space to hear the different ways that people communicate are really important. And sometimes that's not always appreciated that there are different ways of speaking. Oftentimes I get interrupted. <laughs> I've gotten very good at saying, I'm not done yet. I'm going to make my point and I'm going to tell my story in the manner that is meaningful to me and that I think can communicate it because there's not just one way to tell a narrative. There are a lot of different ways. So being able to actually say, hold on a second. I still want to, I'm still speaking here. <laughs> it's, it's been very challenging or one of the challenges to come to overcome without a doubt. The other is the assumptions as a business person in a technical field is that I do have technical capabilities and not to be assumed that just because I don't have an engineering degree that I don't understand how cellular networks work or how um, the ve vehicle networks work. <laughs> and so that's been one of the things that constantly comes up is that you have those abilities to understand technology as well as business. Um, but like Tilly, I've had a lot of support. I definitely have not done this on my own. And so I've been very, very fortunate in my career to have some real advocates. And also, as I've moved up to managerial ranks, to get that training. Because what gets you a seat at the table is not the same skills that are going to get you the position to lead a department and oversee an international organization. Those are very, very different skills. And they are skills that can be learned, but you need the opportunity to learn those skills. Yeah. By having supporters. Um, and so I'd love to know who your supporters were. Um, you, you don't have to mention them by name, but uh, I know one thing that I was at a conference maybe a year and a half ago <clears throat> and the women in the room in the circle said, how many of you had a woman mentor? And uh, no one, no one raised their hand. And I don't think that was a reflection of the fact that there were no supportive women along the way. I think it was a reflection of the absence of women in that circle of women's sort of work experience, which certainly had been my <clears throat> experience and why I didn't raise my hand. So I'd love to hear who your supporters have been. I'm gonna start with you, Michelle. Yeah, it's very interesting. When you look at automotive, there aren't a lot of women in automotive at the moment. Well, when I started 20 years ago, we actually, now we have Mary Barra, which is <laughs> phenomenal that we have a, a female CEO of a major car company. Um, but I did not have a lot of female uh, role models or mentors. I did have um, my uh, boss, Jim Pies, I don't mind mentioning him, who was a huge supporter of mine and remains so to this day, even though he's retired. Uh, but I also have some peers, people like Manuela Papadopoulos, who's the CEO of Designated Driver. She's been a huge supporter of mine and champion and confidant. And it's also part of the reason why I started Women in Automotive Technology. So we could have a group of about 120 women in the Silicon Valley, not only educating each other on automotive technologies, but supporting each other in our careers, doing mentoring and networking, and also practicing how to be a subject matter expert, hold your own space and, and speak publicly on these really, really important. And without that group of women, I don't think I would have survived the move from Los Angeles to the Silicon Valley, where the culture was not the best when it comes for women. 
a little shocking to go from automotive and being surprised at, at the culture in the Silicon Valley, just to put that one in perspective. Great. Raquel, who's been some of your champions or one? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, certainly I like uh, I like the you know uh, uh, the other panelists. I actually didn't have the um, didn't have the uh, you know mentors that helped me through this journey, and this is the way how I learn about the importance of mentors <laughs> by the lack of such uh, mentors. Um, so that being said, uh, now it's different. I have actually three sets of supporters, uh, which are extremely important. On one side, I have uh, my team that gives me his, their unconditional support and dedication to both our mission, as well as uh, my vision of how to accomplish it. I also have, you know, full support of uh, the leadership, uh, Uber leadership, both in terms of uh, Dara, our CEO, I, and I will do some names, I guess. Uh, Dara, our CEO, as well as Eric Mayhofer, which is CEO of uh, ATG, which is um, our self-driving branch. And lastly, but uh, not less important, is the support of my partner, right? Um, having a position of leadership is very, very, very demanding, right? From crazy hours to the roller coaster that comes with it. Right, and I think that without her support, that you know, I would not be here today. That's great, Tilly. Thank you. I'm going to build on Michelle and Raquel's answers and say that um, there were people early in my career, from my professor Betty Deacon, who's now a dear friend, um, encouraged me from the very beginning in this in this crazy path, to my colleagues. Um, I, I also remember, you know, looking up at the time in my early career to. Uh, the first executive director of our agency, Brigid Hines Charon, who was at the time one of the few women leading transportation agencies here in the Bay Area, along with Sharon Banks, who led AC Transit for many years. Um, and these are women, women of color, you know, who had the ability to kind of, you know, pioneer these pathways and model them for up and coming young professionals like myself, and took the time, you know, to to mentor us um, and, and were open and accessible um, you know, when asked. You had to approach them, so I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. later. But mm -hmm. I feel so grateful also for the men um, who mentored me as well. I want to shout out to, to many of them, but it's, uh, I don't want to. So there's just so many folks. But um, mm -hmm. ultimately, I think the family and your friends, the family you choose, you know, that's who's really going to support you as you go through the path. And, um, you know, ladies out there and men, choose wisely. Uh, these are the these are the key <laughs> folks who are going to be in your corner again when uh, you face the big decisions, have the big opportunities or have, you know, have um, fallback, you know, ha have disappointments or have, um, um, you know, challenges. So these are the, the choices that we make. And I, I couldn't be more lucky in, in that department. So yeah, that was that was a, a good choice. <laughs> That's yeah, right. that's great. That's great. So just a little sharing so everyone knows who's on. Um, we have in the about 3% of the audience has zero to one years of experience in mobility. Um, one to five is the majority, which is 30%. Five to 10 years, 23%. And then 10 plus years, 12%. So we have a nice range of people just starting out. And for people who just graduated and are interested in building a career in mobility, um, 8%. So we have a nice diverse group uh, of people who've tuned in. So going back to a poll, we're gonna ask the audience uh, to take the poll. Do you believe there are inherent gender biases in mobility? Um, one of the things we constantly hear about is the pipeline problem in tech and engineering. Um, specifically, 57% of professional occupations in the US in 2019 were held by women, and 26% of those were in professional computing. Um, only 26% of that, and only 3% were African American women in 2019. 7% were Asian women, and 2% were Hispanic women. Um, so in transportation, the situation is even worse. Women represent 15% of the transportation workforce 
cutting, according to a study from Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. So it's a, it gives us sort of a rich area to dive into, which is, um, you know, what are the barriers that women face getting into the mobility space and being successful? So one of the questions that I'd love to ask Tilly relates to urban planning. Um, you know, urban planning historically and typically has been largely driven by men. Um, and so there are um, ways in which transportation has not been deemed in inclusive. And so would love your view on how this can change and is evolving. Thank you, Takedra. I do have hope that we are on um, a good path. Even a few years ago, our Bay Area chapter of WTS, the Women's Transportation Seminar, documented that we were in the 10% range as far as women um, in public and private organizations at the senior and management levels. I just checked this past week and uh, according to the more recent surveys, they're in their third round of their glass ceiling studies. It has popped up to about 30%. You know, obviously that's distributed across different organizations in different ways, but uh, uh, that's encouraging that we're making progress. I think that the 15% nationwide that Mineta documented is a real problem and there are so many roots to it. It's not just for women, it's people of color, it's people of different gender identities and physical abilities. So growing the awareness through programs like this and, and through trainings and through community sort of engagement, I think is critical. The leadership of organizations speaking up and supporting um, training and sort of pro um, sort of equality policies and diversity and other types of um, leadership programs is critical. Providing moms and dads, new moms and dads um, enough time to spend with newborns or to care for elderly, senior, you know, as our, our parents are aging, really critical so that there's not a gender bias there. And finally, documenting through research, and I'll just give a shout out to LA Metro um, for having done some groundbreaking pioneering research last year and their How Women Travel study, um, and please look that up, to diagnose the problem. You know, what kinds of trips should we be planning for that we're not planning for? We're so understandably focused on the, on the peak period commute, but so many more of the trips that women make um, and care, care providers make is in the off peak, um, as well as in the modes of travel where we can see the effects of that unreliability, that slow travel time or, you know, high transit fares. Um, that are not going to be compensated by your commuter benefit check necessarily. So I think that's critical. Um, they, they document the pink tax. Um, and so these are things that we all need to learn about and, and, and also uh, bring into our organizations so that we can be part of the solution. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, a related question, we'll, I'm going to go back to the audience just to do this other because it's a related poll and then throw a question over to you, Michelle, which is, uh, what are the key barriers to getting more women involved in mobility? Um, and one of the options there relates to the gender pay gap. And so, Michelle, I know that WEF has done some amazing work in this area and would just love for you to um, share with us. Sure. Uh, the World Economic Forum puts out that economic uh, participation and opportunity gap. And in the, the latest assessment, we show that it, at the current rate, it's going to take us 257 years to close the gender pay gap. Um, I think we need to be very intentional. If we're going to increase the pipeline for women and diversity and inclusion, within mobility. And I think that requires calling it out and not allowing things like comments such as, uh, well, we don't care who the candidate is. We just want the best candidate. That definitely bothers me greatly because if we are not intentional, if we don't say, yeah, I don't care. If you don't bring me half of the candidates for this role that are women, that are people of color, then I'm actually not interested. Then you have not, you're not looking, you're not trying. 
you really have to try and you have to go above and beyond. And I think that's very important. Uh, when it comes to filling that pipeline, the forum also has something that we call hardwiring gender parity. And this is a framework that is in development that is working to increase representation in all phases of the talent pipeline. And it's asking a couple of questions like identify the, t the five emerging high growth areas in roles and in leadership roles within your company and a commit to recruiting 50% of those to be women and also developing a strong gender equity uh, reward system. So you pay for bringing in diversity and inclusion. It'll get there really fast. But I also want to echo what Tilly was talking about. Because if we don't ask the questions and if about how women travel and how elderly travel and how lower income families and households, how much they pay for their mobility, and we, if we don't understand these questions, we actually can't solve for them. So that also requires having leadership and people in these organizations that represent the communities. And this is also an area of enormous focus for the forum at the moment. So stay tuned. We're going to be coming out with a lot more work and asking for some help as we shine a spotlight on inclusivity in mobility. That's great. I'm, I'm related to this, Raquel, as you're, you know, trailblazing. Um, as you said, there weren't, uh, there weren't people before you and you came into this role and how does your presence, do you think, it's much more of a personal question about your role um, as a trailblazer, sort of pave the way for some of these conversations to happen at the table on inclusive, you know, products and uh, outcomes ultimately? Yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, along the way has helped to you know, show by demonstration that something is possible and that one can have, you know, a different point of view and bring, you know, a, a different sort of, you know, diversity to try to bring solutions to the table. And I think that I, there is much more acknowledgement now of that this is actually a positive, right? I think, mm -hmm. um, I mean, in my current role, we have quite, the, you know, quite a bit of diversity and leadership. So, so it's, it's great compared to, you know, what it was through, uh, through my journey. Uh, but, you know, when I studied, for example, undergrad in Spain, it's very interesting. We were 50% male, 50% female. I was an electrical engineer. And I thought wow. the world was like this, equal. <laughs> And you know, then I move and then the world, you know, was so different than what I have seen. Um, so I think that for me, uh, you know, we need to uh, try to, uh, uh, you know, help uh, through our experience, right? And um, help everybody such that nobody drops in this journey, right? I think that's, that's mm -hmm. important. Now, coming back to the question of you know, the hiring pipeline and how we can uh, improve uh, this. I think, you know, the most important thing really is to be uh, proactive, right? This is not something that you're going to uh, sit down and diversity is going to happen. And it's not a matter of dollars, right? It's, it's more, much more important than the monetary side, the financial side is actually time. You need to spend time, right? And uh, for example, right, we, we need to go and, uh, you know, through scholarships, through uh, workshops, through talks, through mentorship programs with very young women, right? We need to help, uh, you know, help, help them see that actually mobility is a very exciting topic and it's a topic where they have so much to contribute, right? Mm -hmm. um, also, I think that we need to be careful in the interview process. Right. We need to make sure that we have diverse candidates and we need to make sure also that we don't have these biases that inherently we have when we select who to interview and who to make an offer to. Right. Mm -hmm. So we need to always unbiased or compensate for the biases that we all have because we all have biases, no matter how much we care about diversity. The other thing I think that is important is that once, you know, women reach our workforce, you know, it's our responsibility to make sure uh, that we help them into, you know, growing in the organization, 
right? And this is reflected, for example, by the fact that women have a tendency to speak less or say we when they do and they when is we versus male, you know, it's very different. Right, I think uh, when it comes to performance, to promotions, we need to take this into account. Have they been speaking because they haven't done it, or is it because you know they just being shy and they want their teammates to actually have you know the the glory? This happens quite a lot, right? Um, I think it's important also to, yeah, as I say, help them mentor and 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 you know build build through the uh, through the organization and. You know, I think just in general, right, we need to be like very, very proactive. And since we have experienced this, right, we can actually see a lot of these things and we need to educate our colleagues that haven't seen this because they haven't seen it. They haven't been on our side of things, right? Mm -hmm. And having Alice and, and making sure that everybody actually really understand, uh, you know, what's going on here, I think is fundamental because yes, by ourselves, we will never change. Yes. Yeah, I really appreciate all of those comments. It makes me think about, you know, it's exciting because, you know, the Waymo driver is obviously this opportunity for transportation to be equitable, um, accessible, and uh, to eliminate some of these biases. Also, though, the people who we hire to work on these technologies um, are a critical part of how you get there. And so I love hearing all of these really practical um, tips that you all are offering. And recently, I have found myself wanting to name gendered issues more explicitly. And it goes to what you just said, Raquel, you know, whether a woman is more likely or less likely to want to take credit um, for the work of her team. That's challenging because when you're a leader, you have to say, I was responsible for all of this great output. Um, and, and at the same time, give your team the room to shine um, versus saying, I didn't do that, so I can't take credit for it. And so that's, that really resonates too, that we have to um, build, build systems within our companies um, to recognize some of those differences and then account for them. Um, so going to the poll uh, that the audience did, do you believe that there are inherent gender biases and mobility uh, 27% strongly agree, 50% agree, so 77% are in the agree side, 15% neutral, 2% disagree, and 0% strongly disagree. So I think that's really great uh, insight. Um, and then our third poll question, we have the data too, which is what are the key barriers to getting more women involved in mobility? And 19% said limited access to female role models. So I hope that means that self-driven women and all of the other organizations that you all are a part of um, will start to change that. 15% uh, say lack of mentors, uh, which we will turn to in a moment too. 21% say lack of awareness and relevant content, which I think is really, you know, that's, that's a really powerful point, right? Like what, you know, how do, so many of these jobs didn't exist before. And so how do we make sure as these careers evolve that people and schools uh, understand them? 0% said unequal growth opportunities compared to men. 0% said gender pay gap. And 5% said other. So the vast majority think that it's lack of awareness, limited access to female role models, and lack of mentors. Really interesting. Any comments from you all on that before we uh, move on? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the importance of automotive industry um, on the world economy has not really been highlighted lately. If you look in the U.S. alone, it's almost 10 million people are employed in the automotive industry. It contributes about $953 billion to the gross domestic product. And half of the companies that are listed in the Dow Jones Industrial Average get the bulk of their revenues from automotive. We also know that mobility 
is a direct path to prosperity. That if you don't have the ability to get to where the jobs are, to get to where healthcare is, to education, it directly impacts your ability to live and to thrive. So it is of incredible consequence to all of us. And so to see those numbers is a real like, wow, we need to do a better job talking about the importance of it and how there is this opportunity to jump in and to help solve these problems because we do need people's diverse perspectives to help us solve these problems. We're at a huge point right now where we're not going to do this alone. We look at what's happening with public transportation systems all over the world with being greatly constrained with a loss of revenues and then potentially a lot more people jumping into private vehicles, which can cause a lot of other problems, not only safety related, but also environmental. But just thinking about how are we going to move forward? We all really need to come together and envision that future. And then we need to make it happen. And so this, this is a really great opportunity for people to get involved. So I want to spend a little, I'm taking this one back to the forum. We're going to talk a little bit more about this one. That's great. We look forward to what you come back with. I uh, really appreciate that. We're going to pivot just a little now because we're, as I said, we have all these questions that people have submitted and we've tried to group them into themes. And so in, in light of the answers to the last uh, poll, I think we'll dive right in on mentors. We've talked a bit about sort of champions, but let's specifically answer the question of how do you seek out mentors? And is there a way to prepare teachers to offer this type of support to their students? What do you guys think about this? Start with you, Raquel. Yeah, yeah, so I guess as a professor, this one is particularly, uh, <laughs> particularly hitting home. Um, I think, you know, I guess the question is, should you be seeking mentors or should we, should you have somehow, uh, should we provide already the mentorship such that you don't need to seek for mentors? And, and I think that for me, uh, we need to make sure that, you know, throughout your education, there is, you know, all the different mechanism so that you can actually have the mentorship that is going to allow you to go to, you know, the next level, the next thing that you're going to do in your life. Right. So I take this as a, you know, it looks like, you know, from the poll before, right. It was a very, very large percentage, right. Saying uh, no mentors, no female ro uh, role models. Right. So it seems that, you know, particularly in mobility, right. We are doing very bad in this domain. Right. <laughs> or I guess we don't have comparison. Those numbers don't look good to me. Right? So I think, you know, it has to be much more proactive from the mentor's perspective, right, to, um, you know, to provide opportunities. Because I think, you know, oftentimes it's scary, it's hard, one is shy, uh, you don't, you know, you have the fear of ridicule, whatever it is, you know, the imposter syndrome, right, that prevents you from actually seeking that opportunity, that if you ask for it, you know, the mentor is going to be, oh my God, this, this is a brilliant woman that, you know, I would love to mentor, right? So I think that just connecting these two parts and if we can actually create processes that allow us to, um, you know, to connect those, those more easily, I think we will, uh, we will go a long way. And there is, you know, many, uh, these days there is many initiatives to try to do so. For example, in, in the research community, there is, you know, women in X for every conference, every subfield, which is great, right? Uh, but I think, you know, along the way, uh, there is uh, there is more to be done. And, you know, historically, there is some places, meaning whether it is particular uh, colleges, universities, uh, high schools, uh, um, say countries, where it's actually much easier to get access to all these things. And some others it's much more difficult. And I think we should think about you know how to build uh, you know a network that actually is global, because the world is global. Mm -hmm. That's great. Anyone else have anything else to add? Yeah, Tilly, I see you jumping sure. in. Sure, <laughs> I, I hope everyone who's listening, seeking a mentor will link in all of us after this. And I, I'm sure um, it'll be hard for us to respond immediately, but I will be committed to doing my best. And, you know, it just takes that initiative, I think, um, and being proactive. I think, you know, Michelle and Raquel both mentioned this and all of us understand that 
people are busy, you know, even if the intent is there, um, you do have to seek it out. And I think it's part of showing the initiative in your organization, whether you're seeking assignments, volunteering for things, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, um, some gumption, but I do think that that pays off and uh, getting involved in your workplace or even in your um, professional associations in your community. And that can be, again, industry associations, charitable organizations, not, you know, um, be they, you know, sort of advocacy organizations. Um, we have in the Bay Area think tanks like Spur and, and different communities have different ways of getting plugged in. But I think getting involved somehow in your industry, in your organization, seeking that mentorship from those who went before you, of course, not just your boss, um, but diversifying your network so that you can seek that relationship with um, others, not just in your own agency or your own company. Um, but certainly peer-to-peer uh, -peer as well has worked for me and has worked for a lot of our staff, you know, that they've taken the initiative and it's great and we support them. Uh, we provide training budgets. So I hope companies and agencies are providing budgets for folks to, you know, join different um, associations and, and, and memberships and things like that, provide the time um, and the space, um, and as well model, you know, model the ability to mentor formally or informally, because um, we've gone to more continuous, hopefully not just at the, you know, annual review time, uh, different okay. agencies and companies have done different things and there's philosophies around that. Um, but I just also love the informal networks and women are by our nature, very collaborative um, and, and seeking that out in different forums in your life, I found has been really helpful for myself. That's great. That's great. And Michelle, you started to answer this next question. Um, and so it, it may relate also to the mentor, but I mean, what do you think, this is from the audience, what do you think the biggest barrier is when it comes to having women in leadership roles in the mobility sector? And you talked a bit about, you know, carving out your space at the table to communicate your perspectives. What are some of your other observations? It is definitely uh, carving out space and also being um, intentional and, and really seeking to have that diversity. I think we've mentioned it before that it's not going to happen by accident. You need to be open to having different perspectives and voices in the room and to actually hearing them. And if you don't make a concerted effort to diversify your leadership, it just, it simply isn't going to happen. And I think that's very important. And it does also relate to mentorships as well. One of the things that's been very important and helpful to me is to have mentors at different stages in my life. Like for example, when I was pregnant, or right after I gave birth. I was lucky enough that my husband stayed home with our child and that allowed me the freedom to not just be a mother, but also to spend time uh, nurturing my career as well. But I needed parents who were also going through this to help me figure out those balance times because that is also very unique as you're being promoted and managing and then still also nursing. <laughs> you, you could really use it. You could really use an, a mentor to help you figure out how do you say, "I'm sorry, I need to leave this meeting because I need to go express my milk." And can you yeah. really be very blunt? And will the men in the room not look at you like you just said a foreign word? And so I think that when I say, you know, being open to hearing different kinds of communication and different realities, I think that is really, really, really important. And understanding it's not just the mothers, it's also the people who don't have children. They also still have a life and have a right to it as well. <laughs> yeah. So I think being a lot more open um, to different ways of living and different life, different stages in your um, development of your life are important as we, as we look to making the workplace more inclusive. Yes. Yeah, and thank you for highlighting both both of you highlighting some of the um, you know we're self driven women and then some of the self driven women are also self driven women who've given birth to humans or who've adopted humans and so that adds its own element of career complexity so really appreciate 
that. Um, so what are some of the personal initiatives that you've taken to make sure that the challenges faced by you won't be faced by those who come after you? Um, this was actually a question or one of the themes that came from the audience. It's also something that Raquel touched on uh, when she was talking about her journey a bit. So interested in all of your perspectives on that, looking at the, um, knowing that we're nearing the, the end of the, our time, but also just really want each of you to answer this one. Sure, I can jump in. Um, one of the, the first advocacy positions I took was actually in Toyota in creating a LGBTQIA affinity group um, to make sure that um, our employees were recognized and also to help train executives on the issues and on simple things like vocabulary, really understanding how to be comfortable and speaking and recognizing the needs of our LGBT um, associates. And then that I was very proud that that group evolved to being part of the HRC Corporate Responsibility Index. And I, I checked right before coming and uh, Toyota is still on there with a 100% score, which I'm incredibly proud of. And to know that we have senior executives at Toyota who are out and who are open. And when you create a safe place for lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, you're also making a safe place for women. So it's like double bonus right there. <laughs> but then also the women in automotive technology and giving back and having a really practical way for women to practice public speaking and to network have been very, very vital to me. That's great. Thanks. I can go next to Kendra. So yeah. for me, um, one of the things we, we did was we surveyed our staff right away as I became direct, executive director. Um, and I wanted to know, I wanted to know the good, the bad, the ugly. It was our time to do whatever we needed to do to reform what needed to change as well as to grow what was working. So, you know, what's working, what's not, what should we continue doing? What should we stop doing? We did all of that and diversity came up. So we had been doing some, you know, positive things, but we really wanted to step that up. So over the years, we've, you know, instituted things like uh, anonymizing resumes when we um, have uh, recruitments so that hiring managers, you know, may not know in that first round or two, you know, who, who they're going to be interviewing. They just see the, the backgrounds um, in terms of credentials. You know, we looked at the job descriptions and said, you know, do we really need X years of masters and graduates or can some work experience really substitute for that? Um, really understanding, I think, uh, mentor, mentoring opportunities and supporting staff with their own budgets and saying, hey, Go spend this how you would like. If you would like to hire a professional coach or a life coach or sign up for classes or join 20 organizations memberships, it's up to you. So we give everybody $1,000 um, a year at least. And then, you know, more if, if it's warranted. And then we also invest in um, uh, just a lot, of organ uh, a lot of time for folks to participate in cross-cutting knowledge sharing uh, opportunities and we also have a racial equity working group that we've begun and that's been a three-year initiative and it really came in um, to bold relief of course this year but we're so glad we started that work because it's a lot of work you know to look inside your yourself and your organization and then to look to see how you show up in your in your community and, and with your partners outside so those are some of the things that we've started to do and I as Michelle said there's so much intersectionality Right, as you work on gender, race, or you know other types of um, diversity issues, that inclusion um, topics, that these are the benefits that then can um, grow from any of those initiatives. That's great, Raquel. Anything yes. to add to that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so at Uber we have uh, you know a lot of great DNI initiatives. Um, so, so in that sense, you know, fortunate that I don't need to uh, spearhead, you know, all of these things. Uh, but I'm definitely a very, very big supporter. Now, I do a lot of things externally, right, in order to, uh, you know, from mentorship to awareness uh, uh, to all sorts of workshops, etc., to really, uh, yeah, raise awareness of, of the issue. Um, and, you know, inside the organization is more of education 
of both my team and educating them in why do we care about diversity? This is not just yeah, something that you look good if you have diversity. This is not a thing. Or you look back if you're not, which is you know more, more of it than, than anything else, right? So so this is not a real case, right? Uh, there is so many benefits to having a diverse team. And helping them also, uh, you know, they have they come from very different backgrounds, right? Uh, helping them understand uh, you know, what are the biases inherently that we all have and how to watch out for them and how to make sure that everybody speaks, that everybody is heard, et cetera. And, you know, this within my team and within, you know, all, uh, all the different levels of leadership, which I think is, you know, it's important to again, continue uh, to really expose what the issues are because they are not necessarily always so apparent. Although for us they are, because we are in the, in the midst of it, it's not necessarily the case for someone that is not in the receiving uh, side of things. That's great. Well, I really appreciate all of those answers. And I know we have so many more questions. Um, what this Self-Driven Women event reminds me is um, in the time of COVID, for those of us who are still sheltering in place and home, um, is there's humans have a deep seated desire to connect and learn and explore. And so this today is one of the ways that this perfect storm came together and gave us all the chance to be together in this virtual platform. Um, I'll just share that as someone who's been in tech for two decades, I didn't know that I would end up um, in mobility because I believe deeply that technology can improve people's lives if if you focus on the meaningful um, applications of technology. And so I ended up in the mobility space. And then in my time here at Waymo, we've ended up in the middle of, you know, quite possibly the most, you know, racially charged time in my time in tech. And uh, I feel tremendously fortunate to be at a company where from the CEO to the leadership team to many employees have really embraced this moment and have uh, engaged in the conversation and the journey of learning and uh, tolerance and understanding and compassion. And I'll say as a woman um, and as a black woman, that's super important to me, but as the mother of a 11 year old black boy, um, it's, it's everything, like it is the most important thing. And so I just share that as my personal, um, what is different from when I came to how I will see it going forward is the willingness to engage in uh, these really hard uh, and real authentic conversations. So I wanna thank everyone for coming today. I'm really excited to share that we've had about 250 people join us. So um, we will continue to uh, have more of these groups, these opportunities, and thank you to our panelists. Um, really just such an honor to learn more about you and uh, really excited. And Tilly, now that you've put the LinkedIn request out there, I'm sure we're all gonna be connected in more ways than one. Um, and look out for everyone, look out for an invite to our next event. Thank you.